It's my really great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Ellen Alderson, Digital Projects Officer in the Education Outreach Department here at the National Archives, who will be speaking to us today about the ways archival collections can be made not only accessible, but also fun and engaging for visually impaired audiences. For the past year, Ellen has been researching this topic as part of a collaborative professional research fellowship scheme between the National Archives and RLUK. And over the course of the year, Ellen has talked to experts and people with lived experience and explored everything from magnifiers to specialized iPads and tactile images. In this presentation, Ellen will share with us what she has learned so far when it comes to meeting the needs of blind and visually impaired audiences and how she has practically implemented these learnings to expand the reach and accessibility of the National Archives collections and offerings. And so without further ado, I'm really excited to pass over to Ellen, who will now begin her talk. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Ellen Oridson. I am Digital Projects Officer within the Education and Outreach Department at the National Archives in London. Um, and today I'm going to present about a research project I'm just about to complete as part of the uh, Collaborative uh, Professional Fellowship Scheme with the National Archives and RLUK. So I'm going to start by just talking a little bit about uh, the education and outreach department that I'm part of at the National Archives. So we produce and deliver educational resources, experiences, and workshops both on-site and online aimed at educators, students, young people, and community, gr community groups. And a key driving force behind our work is to take the historical holdings of the National Archives, which consists of about a thousand years of government records, and use them to teach our audiences about history. So to do this, we have to find different ways of making these archival documents engaging and understandable for a really broad range of audiences. And on the screen, you can see some examples of different ways that members of my team do this. Uh, so workshop, sorry, workshops, outreach activities, and online resources. So one audience group that we have had less experience with and that I have had less experience with is blind and visually impaired audiences. And that's why I submitted this project to the fellowship scheme. And for those who are not familiar with the scheme, it's a year long research project. So I've spent a year researching this under the mentorship of Eleonora Gandolfi and Anna Bas. And the question that my project has been guided by is how do we make archives not just like technically accessible, but also fun and engaging for visually impaired audiences. So as someone who was working in who was working in the online team, I have been aware of the technical accessibility requirements that we have to follow, but I wanted to go beyond this kind of checklist to see how we could more directly address and understand the needs of this audience group. So on the slide, you can see some questions that I went into this project asking. So, you know, how do we better understand these audiences needs? How can we go beyond just meeting requirements and what opportunities can this increased level of understanding give us? And um, some outcomes from the project, uh, including the creation of a workshop for blind and visually impaired students. And I'm going to go into a bit more detail about that later on in the presentation. But I just wanted to start with talking a bit about why I wanted to pursue this particular project on top of the kind of inherent value in addressing the needs of everyone who, who visits us. And the first reason is because of one of our organizational aims, which is to be the inclusive archive. It's part of our stated goals as National Archives to be available for every person that we serve and uh, that everyone has a right to access what we hold and to experience us through what we do. So on top of that, uh, there are um, some legal requirements, of course, that we have to abide by. And I know that there are people from around the world uh, who are watching. So, you know, there will be different uh, legal requirements for this in different countries, but for us, it is the public sector bodies accessibility regulations from 2018, which builds on the 2010 Equality Act. And uh, this, for example, require us, requires us to adhere to WCAG 2.2 AA standards, which is a really technical term, but essentially this is kind of the base level of web accessibility requirements that can be found online Happy to answer questions about that afterwards, but I won't go into too much detail now. And then finally, there is the kind of statistical background of this audience group that highlights how important it is to address to address it. So in, in the UK, over 2 million people live with sight loss and 20% uh, will live with sight loss in their lifetime. 
And then for my department, specifically the school audience, um, there are over 25,000 children with visual impairment in uh, the UK, age 0 to 16, and then an additional 15,000 aged 17 to 25. And behind these numbers, of course, is also uh, studies collected by the Royal National Institute of the Blind that show that children who are visually impaired have lower educational attainment than children without a special educational need. And progression of young people with visual impairments beyond education is not on par with fully sighted young people. And there's a large well being gap as well due to you know, living in a world that is not accessible. So these statistics highlight the importance of making sure that the educational resources we provide, for example, can be enjoyed equally by visually impaired students as well. So when I started with this research project, this is what I set as my number one guiding principle uh, to prioritize research through conversation and collaboration rather than just uh, reading, for example, or attending training. And that's firstly because this research focuses on an audience group that I'm not a part of um, and that has lived experience that I can never fully understand, no matter how much I research. So I knew from the start that I needed to actually talk to people who are visually impaired and people who work with visually impaired people closely so that they can tell me what is actually needed. And the second reason that you might discover as I go along is that this field of accessibility require, relies heavily on a lot of different technologies that are designed to improve accessibility. And these technologies, there's a lot of them. They have a lot of different levels of usefulness and they evolve very fast. So it can be hard to figure out what you actually need. There are some very expensive technologies out there that are incredibly impressive, but might not be necessary for your organization's needs, for example. So talking to people who work with these technologies has been one of the best ways to evaluate their usefulness and to figure out which ones best suited my department's needs. Okay, so who have I talked to? Um, I put like a big list of people on the screen that have lent me their time and expertise. And I'm not gonna go through, through, go through all of them, but I hope that they show kind of the breadth of um, people with experiences, different organizations, different institutions that exist within this field of accessibility. Um, so for example, I talked to the Disabled People's Archive in Manchester, and the image on screen actually comes from their collections, um, which uh, represents a community view of disability histories, as opposed to, for example, the National Archives, which represents a government view. And um, they spoke to me, for example, about the importance of representation of disabled people's voices and needs within the archive sector and having disabled people themselves involved in representing the stories that can be found in these collections. And then uh, Southampton Sight, for example, is an example of a charity for visually impaired people. There's um, probably have one in your local area as well. Um, and they were fantastic to speak to because they had a not just expertise, but also a repository of different technologies that can be used um, for accessibility needs. Um, Another person on screen here is Hugh Alexander, who specializes in old text, which is a term in, that means visual descriptions for online images. And so for anyone who is creating online content and putting it online, that's a really foundational kind of accessibility need is to create alternative text for those images that can be read out by a screen reader. Um, and some big names on here, like the Royal National Institute of the Blind, Thomas Pocklington Trust, these are big institutions in the UK that work with this issue. And there's also online communities like uh, Ally, International Ally User Group, ATHEN, and these are kind of communities of professionals who work with accessibility and share tips, and they are great resources if you wanna get into this area. I'm also going to quickly go through some of the trainings and certifications I've done, because last time I presented about this, I got a lot of questions about that. So um, the International Association of Accessibility Professionals has some of the most intensive training you'll find in this area. They offer certifications in accessibility that require you to recertify every so often, every few years, based on how much work you've done with accessibility in the meantime. And the certification I got is called, I'm not going to read out the whole thing, uh, but it's CPACC. It's a foundational certification that um, gives you kind of a base level competency and disability access as a whole. 
And uh, you do have to study for a multiple choice exam if you want to do this training. Uh, there is more like uh, low stakes training, I guess, uh, that can be found in from organizations like the RNIB, AbilityNet um, is a good one. Um, and then charities like Southampton Site, for example, will usually offer training sometimes for your organization. And then finally, if you're launching a new digital or online website or application, then there are WCAG compliance testers out there that can make sure that it is uh, compliant with those accessibility requirements. Again, happy to answer questions about any of that uh, later. Okay, so I'm going to also go through some of the basics to know about the barriers faced by people who are visually impaired. And if you already have experience in this area or if you are visually impaired yourself, then I will be going through information you already know probably. Um, so bear with me on that, but uh, just so that we're all on the same page here. So the first thing to know is that visual impairment is like an umbrella category, visual disabilities includes a lot of different things. Um, so you might initially picture someone who is fully blind, but the majority of visually impaired people do have some vision. So from blind people who can see some light or colors to people with low vision who might need the help of a magnifier to see, for example. Um, and this category also includes people with cerebral visual impairment, which is most common amongst young children. And it's a very new area that's still being studied and uh, people who are colorblind as well. And now in terms of barriers, most barriers can be summed up by information that is communicated only through visual means with no audio or tactile alternatives. Um, and I'll give some examples that are more common, but there's an infinite number of examples of barriers that can be faced. But so for example, there is a lack of visual descriptions such as alternative text for websites, which I mentioned earlier, or if you have a, an image that is a key part of a presentation to not describe that image. Um, there is a lack of transcripts or audio descriptions for videos, um, the lack of digital transcripts or OCR transcription or braille versions of printed materials. Um, and just to elaborate quickly on that, so printed materials can, for example, be sent as a digital transcript to someone who has a screen reader ahead of time, for example, um, or you can make OCR technology available. And that essentially is a technology that creates a transcript of a printed text. And if the person is a braille user, having a braille version of a printed text. Um, another barrier is websites and applications that are not uh, keyboard accessible or set up for screen readers. Um, navigational barriers is a big category, but essentially anything that makes it hard for uh, visually impaired people to physically move around an area. And uh, a classic example might be a lack of noise for a green light at a crossing, for example. And then for people with low vision, as I mentioned before, um, having the lack of access to magnification. So for example, websites that don't work with magnification software, or there are no, no magnifiers available at a library, for example. And then color contrast issues essentially means that the contrast between two colors is not strong enough to distinguish if you have low vision, like light text on a light background is an extreme example of that. And then for people who are colorblind, there are issues with information only being communicated through color. And, and finally, I just wanna bring up the idea of incidental learning. So incidental learning is information that we process through our senses without realizing it. And so for sighted people, in a world built for sighted people, a lot of our incidental learning comes from what we can see. So for visually impaired people, that lack of incidental visual learning is not always compensated for. Um, so in we have this is just something to be aware of, especially in educational settings with um, younger people, for example. They might not be aware. We can't assume that they might know the exact same things as a sighted student, for example. And just to quickly touch on the color contrast issue that I mentioned. Um, so on screen, I have a big grid that essentially is a matrix, a color contrast matrix for the National Archives brand colors that I put together based on a code that was kindly generated for me by Matthew Deprose from the University of Southampton, who works with accessibility there. 
And I put his website on the screen, matthewdpros.github.io. And if you want to make sure that the color contrast of your text um, and the background color that the text is on passes accessibility standards, I recommend the website whocanuse.com. Very easy to use website, and it gives you an idea of if they would pass the highest accessibility standard or just some lower ones. OK, so technologies. Because after learning about the field of accessibility for visually impaired people, I wanted to then explore the different technologies that I might want to acquire for my department to help us you know, be more accessible. So I'm going to touch on some of those. But first, I want to just show a quick clip of uh, from a YouTuber called Molly Burke, um, who's great. And check out the full video on her on her channel. But I think it if if you've never seen a screen reader in use, for example, it can just give you an idea of how um, like simple technologies like iPhones are set up for accessibility. So I'm just going to play a little bit of that, and hopefully the sound will work. Uh, let me know if it doesn't. So basically, here's my iPhone, and all Apple products. It's an amazing company. They've dedicated themselves. To making sure that every single product they release is fully accessible to the blind, straight out of the box, no extra costs. So if you have any of these products here at home, like the Apple Watch, the MacBook, the iPad, the iPhone, or an iPod, anything else, if you have that at home and you go into your settings, you'll find general accessibility and then something called voiceover. Don't turn voiceover on unless you've looked up how to turn it off. Although actually, I think now you can do it with Siri. So I think if you have Siri, you can actually say Siri turn on voiceover or Siri turn off voiceover and it'll do it for you. So you can kind of like play around with it too at home and check out how you can do things. But I'll just give you a quick show. So of course this is the rose gold and white iPhone 6S. I love it. And so I just have the finger. That's like the best part. It's already talking. Okay, I got it. All right, so basically, this is like my home page. I have all my apps, and I just. So I just move my finger across the screen, and it reads me what's under my finger. Now, for example, if I want to go to my phone, I double tap on my screen, and then this is when. Okay, so I'm not going to play the whole clip, but um, later on in the clip, she mentions, for example, that she prefers to use her iPhone for because it has a touch screen rather than her laptop, which she finds a bit more cumbersome to use via the keyboard. And so this is just an example to show that for a lot of visually impaired people, um, just like sighted people, you know, a simple iPhone or, or iPad is the only technology that we might use in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, and I bring that up because there's a lot of specialized equipment that I'm going to go through. And visually impaired people are not automatically knowledgeable about all of that specialized equipment that exists. So obviously they will require instructions on using something that they have never used before. Okay, so when I visited Southampton site and asked them about what technologies I should be looking at, their recommendation to me was is if I can only acquire one piece of technology, it should be an electronic magnifier. And they said that this is because, the like I said, the majority of visually impaired people um, do not fall into the completely blind category. Um, and that percentage goes down even further when looking at young people. So arguably, electronic magnifiers could have the broadest application. So they are essentially magnifying tools that display the magnification on a digital screen. And they also provide controls for color contrast, zoom, and brightness. They're yet generally easy to use. They're easy to introduce during a one-off session, even for someone who has never used one before. And they can come relatively cheap compared to other technologies. So for example, a simple handheld version can cost around 100 to 300 pounds. So I arranged for my department to acquire an electronic magnifier. I was really lucky. I found one that was unused that another department had purchased years ago um, on the, uh, which I've put an image up on the screen, but essentially it's got quite a big monitor compared to a smaller handheld one. And we have successfully trialed it in an on-site workshop that had a class with, with just one visually impaired student in the class. And my colleague, Alice, who was teaching the workshop, and I found that the best way to introduce it to the student was in a way that didn't draw too much attention. So Alice invited the table she sat at to look at the documents through the magnifier. 
and her friends were more than happy to use the magnifier alongside her to do the tasks during the workshop. And she used the contrast tools to be able to read the text on the you know, old manuscript, the archival document that they were looking at. Okay, so another piece of technology that I have looked at is a tactile tablet. This one is called the Feel If Tablet. This is one example of a range of products that incorporate some form of tactility um, into a tablet device. This one has small bumps all over its surface that buzz slightly under your fingers as you click and move around the screen. It also comes with an integrated screen reader as well as ready-made games that are completely non-visuals and you can upload your own upload your own images in games. And I'll just show a quick clip of what that might look like. Spain, France, Germany, Belgium, United Kingdom. Yeah, so hopefully the sound worked, but basically someone moving their finger across a map and it reads out the different countries as they go over it. Um, and this is a uh, really, really impressive technology. What, what I found uh, was that the downside of this tech is that it's very expensive. So it's difficult to incorporate for just one single visually impaired student in a class as compared to the electronic magnifier, which was much easier. And it was too expensive for us to get one each for a whole class of visually impaired students. Um, but it's very good to be aware that it exists because it has a lot of potential exciting uses. So finally, I explored the world of tactile images and models. You probably have seen tactile models around, like smaller versions of large objects. So you might have visited a building that has a smaller version of the building inside that you can feel what the building looks like. Um, and tactile paving is, I haven't looked too much into this because it's more exhibition design, but uh, which it's essentially a uh, flooring that includes tactile features to make it easier to navigate by a cane. Um, I visited the, the Welcome Collection did this in, in their recent exhibition, Milk. Uh, I was shown around that exhibition. Um, and then finally, tactile images. Now, this is what I, um, what kind of caught my attention the most because they, uh, most of our archival records are two-dimensional. So tactile images essentially take two-dimensional images and make them touchable. Um, and they have a very long history. So I put an image on the left here of a tactile map of the United Kingdom in our collection that came from an asylum for the blind in 1839, the very old. Um, and this map might not be as useful as the tactile images we have today. So I put on the right a tactile image of one of our documents showing the destruction left by the Great Fire of London um, by George Rhodes. And I'm gonna touch on him in a sec. Um, but yeah, there's an art to tactile images. So they cannot just be one-to-one -one reproductions of a uh, two-dimensional image. They need to be modified and simplified to be readable for someone touching it. Um, and if you're interested in this, there are organizations that you can pay to produce tactile images, um, such as the RNIB, um, or you can even acquire actually a specialized printer and paper and software, and you can produce them yourself. Um, this is like an example of a uh, software that can produce tactile images. Um, okay, so this brings me to the final part of my presentation. I'm going to kind of discuss a workshop that brings all of this, uh, these things that I've been talking about together. And unfortunately, I can't tell you how the actual workshop went because it's not happening until Monday, the 18th of March. Um, but it will be a totally new experiment for us. So it'll be very exciting to see how it goes. So it's an all day workshop for a group of uh, visually impaired students coming down from New College Worcester, which is a specialist school. Um, and it will be about 12 students from year eight and nine and 70% of them will be braille users. And the workshop will introduce them to four different stories from our collection that align with what they're learning at school. And they will be introduced first to a tactile version of the document. Then they will receive a mystery bag of sensory items that evoke the subject matter of the document, like sound items, smell items, items that you can feel. Then they're gonna get context for the document um, using sheets that we're gonna have in both large print and in braille. Then they will get to touch the actual document that they've been studying and they'll do a presentation about the document that they've become specialists on. And then finally, they're gonna get to touch original documents that were touched by Henry VIII and Elizabeth I. And so this workshop has really been an exercise in collaboration. 
Um, so here are the external parties that are involved in preparing this workshop. And it's really based on a collaboration I formed with George Rhodes, who is digital accessibility team lead at the University of Westminster and is completing a PhD on 3D printed tactile images. And his research focuses on how tactile images can be improved further and be easier to produce and to read. And so as part of our collaboration, he's producing tactile versions of five of our documents that will be used during the workshop and then be placed on our website for anyone with a 3D printer to download and use. And then secondly, I've been working with Jeanette normanton Airy, who is head of uh, history at New College Worcester and has decades of experience teaching visually impaired students. And in fact, she was part of a previous National Archives project, Person 4099 in 2007, um, which is great. And she has been organizing for her students to come down, obviously, but she's also been an invaluable help in giving feedback on the models as well. And then finally, Kate Elizabeth Antelak is um, uh, a teacher who is uh, both experienced in teaching uh, at mainstream schools and visually impaired schools, and she has lived experience as she is blind herself and a braille user as well. So we have been lucky enough to have her uh, come on board as a consultant for us, which has been really invaluable in helping us prepare for, for the workshop. And then I have to mention the people internally who are involved because I'm definitely not the only one who has been preparing this. Um, so Hannah Carter, education manager, will be delivering the workshop. And Rachel Hillman has been preparing that workshop together with Hannah. Um, Claire Horry, my line manager, has also been working with me on this collaboration from the start. Um, and Elspeth McGregor has supported us. Uh, and then Alice Middlemiss, and I think also her colleague Ellie Quick will be giving a repository tour taking the students through our repositories before the workshop. And then uh, Natalie Brown and Sarah Petter from Collection Care have helped us with some document samples that the students will be able to touch to get an idea of the archives. And also they, along with um, some other people from their team, Helen Mayer and Kat Katarina Williams have helped us do a touching assessment of the documents to see how much the students will be able to touch them. So yeah, just wanted to give everyone their due on that because it has been an amazing collaborative experience. And I just wanna show some examples of the tactile versions of these documents as well. Um, so these are each of the documents that the students will explore. So this is a Tudor document um, from 1567 and the tactile version there on the right. We have this uh, John Blank's wage slip. This one is quite interesting because it's text-based mainly. And so it'll be interesting to see how this one was requested specifically by the school. So it'll be interesting to see how the students react to feeling the calligraphy. Then this, um, I love this one because it has all these tiny houses and bridges and stuff, but it's a map illustrating a land dispute in about 1450. And then this is an engraving um, showing the Peterloo massacre in 1819. And this is uh, the draft form on the right. You can see the software that's being used to create that 3D printed version. Okay, so time to finish off. So just returning to the outcomes and aims of the projects, um, the next steps will be kind of evaluating how successful the workshop is. So um, we're gonna have a feedback form that will be used for that evaluation and collect data throughout the workshop on how effective these tactile versions are for the students. And hopefully that workshop will then be able to be trialed with other groups of students as well. And a lot of what I've gone over here today, I'll also summarize in a toolkit that I'll be putting together for people who are working with kind of collections in archives, for example, who want to make a start in making them accessible and don't have the knowledge to know where to begin really. Um, and yeah. So just to end, since this is an exercise in conversation from the start, um, I by no means am an expert in this topic. So I wanna kick off the Q&A by asking if you have any particular experiences or challenges you think would be interesting for others to hear about or for me to hear about, pop them in the chat and I will very happily read them. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Ellen. That was such an interesting and thought-provoking talk. And it's been so wonderful to hear about your fantastic project and how well it's been progressing. 
Um, so yes, yeah, so I'll open the floor to questions from the audience now. Um, so we've got a question for Ellen. If you could put it in the Q&A function at the bottom, and that's when I will um, monitor these and then we'll read them out to Ellen on your behalf. Um, so yeah, put them in the Q&A function rather than the chat. That'd be brilliant. And we've already got lots of questions for you, Ellen. <laughs> So yes. I'll get started. Um, so the first I've got here is from um, Ruth Gard. So it's a question about um, consultants and your kind of collaborations. So she asked, um, did you pay consultants with lived experience who worked on this project? And perhaps you could also perhaps expand more about your collaboration strategies within this. Yeah, sure thing. So um, I, yeah, it depends on uh, the, the consultant that I mentioned for the project, yes, has been paid for her lived experience, absolutely. Um, other collaborators are doing it as an unpaid thing because it's mutually beneficial. Um, so with my collaboration with George Rhodes, for example, is um, you know mutually beneficial for, for both of us. And then uh, as I was seeking information, uh, some people were paid and some were not depending on how they kind of collaborate or depending on how the interview kind of came about or um, how me talking to them came about. But the consultant specifically, absolutely, was very important to to pay her. Yeah. Brilliant. There. Thank you so much. Um. So our next question is from Re at the University of Reading Collections. Um. She got question goes feedback from students working with our collections is that dyslexic students who rely on screen readers and other software may also share the barriers in accessing text in the archives and may benefit from digital transcriptions. Um, so they wondered whether you'd found cases where the needs of visually impaired users might overlap with other stakeholders? I mean, absolutely. And uh, I think one of the one of the concepts that I was introduced to um, when I was first starting to look into this was that this idea of universal design, which um, is a kind of concept that comes up in accessibility fields sometimes, but it's the idea that instead of having something that is not accessible at the start and accessibility features are kind of added to it, then uh, instead it's kind of broadly accessible to not just one group from the start, but to like a lot of different groups. And one of the ideas behind that is that if something is accessible for one group, then it's usually, it holds benefit for people who are not maybe directly part of that group. And that can be people who have disability needs that overlap, like definitely people who have dyslexia. And this is not something that I uh, researched heavily during this time, but I have definitely heard that um, screen readers, for example, are one of the tools used by people with dyslexia but also people who are uh, who don't have a disability need um, or an access need can also you know benefit from making something that is accessible so i think the idea of changing accessibility from being something that we have to kind of uh, force or we have to add instead of it's like a feature and it's an opportunity yeah brilliant um, so now i've got a question from rachel brown who asks is it expensive to attain tactile images of documents well, as I mentioned, we are not paying for these ones very luckily because we formed this collaboration. The RNIB, um, and actually Sarah, you have sourced, sourced tactile images from the RNIB before. So you're probably better to answer this question actually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, in my in my past life, I worked um, with the National Trust and yeah, sourced some tactile images from the RNIB, which they do have a cost attached, but um, Definitely, if you're in the UK, they were very open to collaboration, to talking about your own budgets and your own needs. And um, so I found them really useful to fit in within my own project budget and working around the small pot of money that I had, getting the most out of it. And um, so, yes, yeah, so it is it is an expensive, definitely a, a worthwhile investment. And yeah, the people I worked with were extremely accommodating with my small budget um, and really produced really fantastic results. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so thanks, Ellen. Double. <laughs> Well on that. Um, so, yeah, so I've got another question from Ree from the University of Reading Collections. Um, so they ask, did you explore OCR and audio transcriptions at all mm. in your work? So I didn't get a chance to look into this too much. Um, I only had a year, unfortunately. So I was kind of really trying to focus on technologies that I saw would be like very readily integrate integratable. But I really do want to explore OCR technology a bit more. Um, and the university mentors that I um, that I had, uh, especially Eleanor Gandolfi, I know she has a lot of experience with OCR technology. So I can't give you too much personal experience with that. Unfortunately, I haven't used it ever. 
Um, so yeah, I just know that it exists. I know it's very helpful, but um, yeah, can't give a, any personal experience with OCR technology. Yeah. Great, thank you. Then we've got a question from Erin Delaney. Um, who goes, in terms of producing a 3D printed tactile version of a document, how does producing the design for a, the 3D printed piece actually work? So does mm. someone have to design it or can software be used to generate it from the original image? And what kind of role is involved in designing this? Is there a graphic designer needed to be on board for this? Uh, graphic designer does not need to be on board. And I have not been producing these 3D printed images myself. So um, George would be much better at answering this question, but uh, he does do both designing and kind of generating. So I know that he starts with an automatically generated um, image, but that needs to, that cannot stop there. Like, first of all, it needs to be smoothed out. Like when you first generate it, it can be very jagged, very like the textures are not great. And I know he does so much work in, um, you know, simplifying the image, making it readable. And we had like a really long session with them. Um, Jeanette from New College Worcester, where we basically went through each model and she was like, they won't be able to understand what that is. Um, you know, they will be under, able to understand that. So, um, and we still don't know how efficient these will be because we still haven't done the workshop yet. But yeah, so it's not just an automatically generated thing. It does require a lot of work and you need to really think about what do you want to communicate with this uh, image? Because what you want to, what you want them to learn about it, what you want them to take in about it, that will change how you design it. So, for example, for the Great Fire of London map that I briefly showed, it's a really, really, really detailed map. But we said, you know, we need to show that the fact that this big area was destroyed by the fire. That's the main thing that they need to learn, and so that's what how it was oriented, how the creation of that tactile version was oriented yeah so hopefully that answered the question <laughs> yes that's really, and it actually leads into our next question from rosie about kind of the requirements of the tactile images and kind of the inf she asked kind of what information do you hope the students can learn from like the different shapes and textures so, so whether there's anything else you want to add on on that yeah or... um yeah so the textures thing is interesting i think traditionally a lot of tactile images use different patterns to differentiate um, different parts of an image. So for example, you might use stripes or dots to represent that, you know, this is one section of the image. Like say you have a woman wearing a dress, you might use one texture for the dress and one and something else for her face or something like that to show that, you know, these are different things in the image. So we are not quite going that route because this um, 3D printing technology, like George is developing it as we as we speak, kind of as part of his PhD. So he's experimenting with using textures that might be a bit more naturalistic. So using grass texture where there is supposed to be grass and things like that. In terms of what we want the students to pick up from these images, they are becoming um, specialists in the images. So actually for these ones, we do want them to pick up quite a broad range of things and um, quite a broad range of details. Not all the details, obviously, but we want them to get a good idea of why this document is important, what kind of histories it shows um, and that kind of stuff. So yeah, so we have included as many details as we can in the tactile versions, and it'll be very interesting to see which of those details are readable and which are not. Definitely. No, it's really exciting your workshop on Monday to test all these all these ideas out. Um, so the next question is from Ali O'Hagan from Queen's University Belfast. She first says, thank you for such an interesting talk, Ellen. Um, and then she's asking about what the turnaround time is for accommodating a request um, to consult a tactile image. And can you say a bit mm -hmm. more about the technology used for this? Anything else to add on that? Yeah, so it's 3D printed. I can't give too much uh, of an insight into the technology aspect because I did not personally produce them. Um, but what I can say is that traditional tactile images that you might get from the RNIB, for example, are not generally 3D printed. So they, I mentioned that you can acquire, for example, a printer and specialized paper. Um, and the way that this works is that it's a special kind of paper that re reacts with 
ink in, in order to create small kind of swellings in the paper. And this creates like raised images, essentially. And so you would use a software to create an image that is kind of readable as you, as I've been talking about, and then you print it and the paper kind of is raised up by this uh, ink. Uh, I can't remember the exact name of the paper. I think it's Swole paper or something like that, but there you can buy this, uh, you can have a Google online. Um, and yeah, so 3D printing is not the traditional material for the, these kind of things. And I believe the RNIB does not use 3D printing. As for the turnaround time, um, Sarah, you might be able to answer this from the RNIB because I have not ordered personally from the RNIB before what the turnaround time is. For me, definitely, I would give it at least a couple of months um, if you can, uh, just to prepare like the design to make sure that it is, um, that for me, that is what we needed, yeah. Yeah, I would say from my experience, it was the designing time that took up yeah. the most time, kind of sending off the folk we had photographs, come back as the accessible images, and then talking a lot of that. And then the actual printing time was quite quick, but the yeah. designing did take um, exactly, yeah, at least yeah, a nice month. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, so something that if you have a printer that you have actually acquired for your organization, the printing would I I don't think it would take long at all. Like I think it would be immediate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That'll be, yeah, really good to have. Um, so the next question is from Lara Moon, who asks, are there any free technologies you would recommend for us to them to look into providing as they have very limited resources? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know exactly where you're at in your kind of accessibility journey. Um, so I would probably start by looking at um, how accessible your kind of digital content already is like I would always recommend that if you want to make things accessible the first thing you can do is to make sure that those base level requirements are already met so things like being able to produce good alternative text things like testing your website with a screen reader like screen readers come built in to basically any technology that we have so like the Microsoft one is called narrator for example those kind of things are completely free and they're super easy to do. Um, I will give a warning about uh, free accessibility checkers because they, I wouldn't like rely on them as a reliable indicator as to whether something is accessible or not because they only catch about 50 to 60% of accessibility issues in a website. So being able to learn to do really basic manual testing so for example, switch on your screen reader, do some keyboard testing and make sure that your images all have visual descriptions and alternative text. That is like a base level that you can do with any kind of online presence you have. And in terms of on-site things, if you don't have the money to do like an electronic magnifier, you can have magnifying glasses. They're not free, but they are much cheaper. Um, you can kind of look at how your offerings are structured. Like how are your workshops structured? Do they, are they um, built from the ground up for a sighted audience? And if so, how can you kind of change that around? I do. It is really difficult when things are built as not accessible from the ground up and adding accessibility features onto them. But yeah, th I think those are the kind of very base level free things that you can do immediately. Um, I know I didn't mention any technologies. There are not, I don't, I wouldn't say there's like a free technology out there that I would like really recommend, but a lot of the stuff you can do now are free. And it's just about like basic, uh, learning very basic stuff. Yeah. Thank you. That's yeah. Really, really practical advice there. Um, so our next question is from Florence, who wants to hear more about the conservation testing that you mentioned. Um, they're interested particularly in hearing about the non-specially created original archive items users were invited or are, are going to be invited to explore by touch and the considerations there as this is more achievable for some archives who can't afford to get tactile images produced and um, so perhaps if you want to talk a little bit about that so sorry the question was about the archival so the material Oops. Yes, about basically about the conservation testing um, that happened this morning, actually, um, and about That's kind happening. of how yeah. how um, yeah archives who can't afford tactile images, kind of the ways mm. you approached 
involved in collection care, in testing archival yeah. materials and getting that safe touch for those archives and anyone out there who can't afford to commission tactile images when they want to yeah. do these types of workshops. Um, I mean, I'm very lucky to have a very enthusiastic collection care department that Sarah is part of, um, who are very open to kind of, you know, allowing things to be touched more by visually impaired audiences, for example. Um, and Sarah, you are the one who actually was part of doing the assessment from Collection Cares. I don't know if you want to add something before I kind of continue on answering this. Yeah, I mean, I would say the assessment kind of um, came about because working with Ellen, um, being an archive, obviously, our documents are handled by the reading room users, but it's that repetitive touch that can cause damage to our archival documents. And we usually don't recommend touch on kind of um, media, so text, kind of painted surfaces, anything that's a bit more vulnerable, we recommend that it's not touch. Um, but because touch is so important to Ellen's, Ellen's workshop and these students and really engaging with these documents, um, we brought some of our conservators in to see what ways we could encourage kind of safe handling for this audience in these circumstances, where could we allow touch more broadly across the documents so the students could get a real feel of a true feel of this of these texts um, without causing damage. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to do it fully more on a we're something we're hoping to look into um, this year. We're kind of really excited to kind of collaboratively work with education on this to kind of assess our documents, assess the workshops we offer and with audiences like blind and visually impaired students, kind of how we can facilitate this handling yeah. of the documents in a really safe, safe way but to ensure that e equity of um, access to our collections. Yeah, and just to add to that as well, if you want to engage visually impaired audiences and you can't do like actual tactile objects, and if most of your objects are two dimensional, um, there's still things to feel about those objects that can tell you a lot about them. Um, so like different materials, you know, that kind of thing is something that we will be highlighting for the students. Um, so they will start the workshop by exploring different types of archival materials, and then they will actually get to feel those materials on the original documents. And the other thing, if you don't have actual like tactile versions, which is like um, a luxury, obviously, visual descriptions. So I mentioned this earlier that that's one of the base level things you can do. It's completely free. There, there's guides out there on how to do good visual descriptions. Um, a lot of those guides focus on um, alternative text that is SEO oriented. So it might be more focused on, you know, keep it within 120 characters. You don't have to do that, uh, especially not if you're like doing an in-person workshop. Um, you just be very specific for, with your visual descriptions. You don't have to describe everything that's on there. Describe the things that you want to communicate. Um, there's also guides out there. Um, I don't have the link in my presentation, unfortunately. I'm happy to share, but there's guides out there for creating visual descriptions for complex images as well, like um, really detailed images or diagrams and graphs and stuff like that. So even if you don't have a tactile version, the power of a visual description of a really good visual description is one of the foundational kind of accessibility tools that you have in your toolbox. Oh, brilliant. Thanks, Ellen. Um, so we've got about eight minutes left. If anyone has any last minute questions, please do send them into the Q&A. I will take this opportunity to ask a question of my own for Ellen. Um, so you mentioned in your presentation, you're going to include kind of sensory materials in your workshop. And I'm kind of, this is an area I'm really interested in, kind of especially kind of the tactile, the sounds and the smells you said you're going to include. I wondered whether you kind of could expand a bit more on this and um, let us know what materials you're going to have in this workshop. Yeah, sure. And sound and smell are both tools that ha um, our on-site teaching team have incorporated in their previous workshops as well. But essentially, uh, for the sound, we have uh, purchased these do dog sound buttons that people use to speak to their dogs. <laughs> um, but we're not using them for that. Basically, you just record some sound onto it. And then when you press the button, that sound will play. So yesterday, we had great fun recording uh, ourselves as kind of Peter Lou protesters or a, an argument about land ownership for the map. So creating these kind of sound clues about what the document means. And then in terms of sense, we are including kind of smell pots um, that we are not using artificial smells um, because 
we've used those in the past and they can sometimes be a bit overpowering. So instead we're trialing using smell pots that have actual grass in them, for example, that can, you know, get a grass smell that again will give the clue about, you know, this document might have something to do with land or with pastures, things like that. So it'll be exciting to see how well those incorporations of sound and smell go. I will say um, it's one thing that our consultant kind of told us to really warn about was, you know, warn about the fact that, you know, you're going to be using sounds and smells and also you're going to be touching um, certain things that you might not be prepared to touch um, because that can be a bit like shocking or uncomfortable for some people. So we're definitely going to, going to incorporate those kind of warnings. Um, for example, in the first part of our workshop, they'll be exploring fluffy rats, um, soft toy rats, because that's part of the National Archives origin story. And so we definitely have to warn them about that. Otherwise there might be some, <laughs> Kate was like, they might freak out if they just feel like a fluffy rat <laughs> inside this box. So yeah. Oh yes, yeah, I think you need that bit of bit of context to get them, <laughs> get them going, be aware of the sens sensory sensitivities. Um, oh, we've got a couple of questions that have just come in and we've got five minutes left, so I think we can get through them. Um, so the first question is from Anna Briggs, who asks, are there volunteer organizations that not only do voice recordings of novels, et cetera, for visually impaired people, but also might read and record archive documents for smaller archives with limited funds? Do you know of any volunteer oh. organizations that would do this? That would be amazing. I have never heard of that. Um, the standard organization in the UK, at least, that does this kind of service is called Vocal Eyes. So um, vocal and then E-Y-E-S. Um, I think that, yeah, that's what they're called. Um, they do charge. I have not I have not heard, unfortunately, of a volunteer organization that does this. Um, they might exist. Um, have a look you might be able to do something if it's very short voice recording you could potentially do it in-house um you don't necessarily need a professional for it if you're recording a transcript for something for example but yes unfortunately i don't have any volunteer organizations that do that but good question that is a really good question we'll see see what's out there oh yeah someone posted the link to vocalize in the chat thanks oh thank you <laughs> Um, and then I've got a question, um, which might well be our last, from Andy Corrigan, who asks, will you be publishing all of this somewhere where you're done? And perhaps I'll add on to that to kind of sum up, perhaps, where, where's your kind of next steps? Where's your ambitions with this, um, yes. following on from this project? Yeah, I will be publishing um, a toolkit. Um, I'm not, I, I'm going to kind of aim this, similarly to have done this presentation, as an introduction to people who want to, not, not as any kind of official best practice guide, because I don't have the expertise for that, but someone, if someone wants to incorporate more accessibility, a kind of toolkit that can sum up, you know, how much different things cost, what are the easiest things you can do. Um, yeah, so I definitely will be publishing that on um, the National Archives website, probably. Um, we'll also be publishing a blog, I think in April on the National Archives website, saying how the uh, the workshop went if you want to see how it goes 